coming today uh, to discuss this very important topic to our city. And I echo what Tom said earlier, crime is an issue for us. It's hindering our economic development um, in the city. And when we fix this issue, we're all going to be better off for a variety of reasons. But to be part of the solution, we need to be part of the conversation. We can't let others do this. This is about all of us. And that's why we're here today. And I am thrilled that the mayor is here to join us. So let me give you the official part about the mayor's bio. He was sworn into office in December 2009 and re-elected to a second term in December, or excuse me, in 2013. Prior to serving as the chief executive officer of the city in Albuquerque, he was in the New Mexico legislature. He was elected there twice. He's an accomplished entrepreneur with over two decades of experience in New Mexico and the Southwest. Mary Bar Mayor Berry knows what it's like to meet a payroll and to write a paycheck and to have to pay the bills. And I think that's one of the things that makes him a very good mayor. You know, we all watch TV. Maybe some of us have watched a little less of it lately. And we see that this is not just a problem in Albuquerque. We travel and we see that crime is a problem in the United States and worldwide. But you know, the difference here is we're led by a mayor who is deeply passionate about this issue and wants to fix it. You know, it sounds like a no-brainer that the mayor should be passionate about this, but I can promise you mayors in all cities are not passionate about fixing this issue. You know, in Mayor Barry, the passion is steadfast. This is not a short-term issue. He knows it. And he talks about those things that, quite frankly, are difficult to talk about. He doesn't shy away from the hard issues. He doesn't want to sweep them under the rug. He wants to talk about them. He wants to fix them. And he wants to hear from us and work with us so that he can continue to work with us and deal with these issues head on. So I think Mayor Berry is exactly the type of leadership we need in the city of Albuquerque to deal with an issue like this. So please welcome me in bringing up to the stage our mayor, Richard J. Berry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to move this just for a minute. Well, good afternoon. I need more energy than that. This is an hour long speech with about 45,000 pieces of data in it. So, good afternoon. All right. Thank you so much. I, uh, I appreciate I'm going to move this mic. And you tell me, whoever's mic that was. And that was, can you still hear me? Sorry for the logistics. OK, uh, first of all, thank you so much for letting me come today and talk about an issue that really impacts every one of us in our city. And as I talk to mayors around the country, hundreds of them, uh, in fact, I'll be uh, in New York tomorrow with mayors from around the country talking about issues. This will be on the top of the list. I want to thank Terry. I want to thank uh, the, the board at the chamber and all the members for being willing to tackle this issue as one of your priorities for this year. Um, you know, you, you elect mayors and governors and presidents and Congress people and legislators, but we need the civic leadership if we're going to have the conversations that matter. So thank you so much. I'm just going to start seven years ago. When I took office, uh, I put forward a 15-point plan to tackle crime in Albuquerque, and we, we tried to think of new strategies uh, to make Albuquerque a better place to be a parent or a kid or a business owner and quite frankly a worse place to be a criminal and in many ways those strategies worked uh, they really did uh, we enjoyed historically low crime rates in Albuquerque for several years and now as we sit here today we are experiencing a rise in crime especially in auto theft and it's time to take a hard look all of us at why that is happening and it's time to, to take a look at what has changed because a lot is the same, but a lot of things have changed. And what is it that has changed that is making these crime categories increase across the board in some ways? The fact is a lot has changed uh, in the last seven years. Some of the changes are very recent, and some of them uh, took place right after I took office. Uh, as we talked about, you read about in the paper this morning, the jail has about half the population that it had just a couple of years ago. Right after I took office, the state prohibited return to work, which is the practice of police officers uh, retiring and going back to forces around the state. 
and that has uh, really impacted departments around the state of New Mexico. Then the, the state legislature passed Senate Bill 27 to make pensions more solvent, an important topic, but it also created a fiscal cliff for some of our officers, in fact, many of our officers, who found themselves retiring earlier than they normally would have so that their cost of living increases weren't frozen for seven years. Of course, we have unprecedented reform measures going on in Albuquerque now. We have a DOJ settlement agreement. Recently, the Supreme Court actions have um, put changes in how judges can hold people in jail without bond, and they came down with a case management order for only one of 13 DA districts in New Mexico, ours, on how fast they have to put together cases. Once again, all of these things are for good reason. I want you to keep that into mind uh, as we talk today. So our officer numbers are down at our department, about 20%. That's not an uncommon number in New Mexico, and it's not an uncommon number in the United States. And frankly, today, it may be more difficult to be a police officer than ever. It's a tough, tough time to be a cop. Some of these changes, uh, as we found out, have led to more people and some criminals, uh, sometimes with long criminal records, being released back out onto the streets of Albuquerque. So there's a lot of changes. But unfortunately, some of the things that need to change haven't. New Mexico is still, as I talk to our partners um, in law enforcement, one of the states uh, that, quite frankly, don't have as tough criminal laws as some of the surrounding states around us. So after these historic lows for several years, crime is up, especially auto theft. We're going to dig deeply into that today. And I know you're concerned. I know you're concerned because I'm concerned. I'm concerned as your mayor, I'm concerned as a husband, I'm concerned as a business owner. I want answers, and I know that you want answers too. So that puts us at a place where we have a choice today. We, um, we can resort to oversimplification and sound bites. We can resort to political rhetoric, or we can actually roll up our sleeves and get to work. And I'm here to be a proponent of the second thing. I'm gonna try to not make this a political speech today. There are a lot of uncomfortable facts and there's enough to go around, to me included, as your mayor. So um, let's cut through the rhetoric and let's do it with information, let's do it with facts. And to do that, I thought it was important to study the data. And I do that a lot, that's kind of an MO of mine as your mayor. Um, when we have a problem, I'd rather study it and then make informed decisions on policy. So about six months ago, we hired Dr. Peter Winograd. Uh, Peter's here, I just saw him a minute ago. Peter's right over here. Uh, respected researcher in New Mexico, former UNM researcher. And he has spent about six months uh, digging through the data. And it's a lot more data than I thought he would come up with, quite frankly. And uh, we're gonna address that today. We're gonna present that to you. And then I'm going to put some strategies forward. And I also wanna start today by telling you there is good news. We can do this, okay? We can do this. This is not some impossible task. It's not overly complicated, but it does take political will. And it's going to take some changes, both to the way we police in Albuquerque, it's gonna take some changes in the criminal justice system, and of course, what I'm gonna give you today are my ideas. We have a lot of smart people in the room. A lot of smart people made these changes. They are good intentioned changes, but they have sometimes unintended consequences. So we're gonna do four things today. We are going to give you a historical perspective of Albuquerque's crime. I think that's important, especially for the chamber folks, because when you're talking to business people, you're gonna see some interesting and, quite frankly, some positive data. We're gonna tell you where crime stands today. We're gonna to share the research with you, and most importantly, we're gonna put some strategies forward today that I think will help. But there is no magic wand, and there is no easy answer, and we're in this together, and we need to work together. So let's, let me start by putting crime into a historical context for you. Right now, as I've said twice already, after several years uh, of low crime rates, we've had some high profile tragic incidents, including the murder of our children and the murder of our police officers. Officer Webster, Officer Benner, Officer Chavez and Hatch, Officer Corvinas in Alamogordo. And it's easy to think that crime must be at all time highs. But the fact is, it's not. Regardless of how it feels, crime is not at all-time highs. In fact, crime trends are lower in recent decades, not just in Albuquerque, but across the United States. 
The charts I put up here in front of you, and I, I, I hope you can kind of see these charts because we're going to refer to them all day long today. These charts compare official FBI crime rates over the past four years. And we've done it by mayoral administrations. And let me just say this. This has nothing to do with who the best mayor is, okay? Every mayor is going to go out in Albuquerque. Every mayor I've talked to has gone out and wants to make our community safer. But we've done it this way to show you because everybody remembers by, you know, by who the president was, who the mayor was over time rather than just putting up 25 years in here. And you can see that over the past six years, um, especially, uh, crime is going down both from a property and a violent crime standpoint. You might be surprised to know that if you take the, the administrations on average, our average property crimes in Albuquerque over the last six years are about 3,000 less property crimes than the previous administration, and we're, when we're experiencing about 6,000 less property crimes than the administration before that, and that was less than the administration before that. So FBI crime data also shows that Albuquerque saw the lowest four overall crime rates in 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013, as well as five of the lowest six violent crime rates in modern history, including two years ago when we had the lowest murder rate on record. That was 30, 30 too many but that compares to 56 in 2009. So none of this is meant to imply that city's not an issue. All you had to do was read the journal. If you're one of the 9% of people in New Mexico that's not concerned about crime, go ahead and raise your hand. You can probably leave. But it's important to remember that we live in a safer community than in decades past. And when we talk about crime, you have to always remember, if you, and I had to learn this as a mayor, we have to talk about it per capita. And we talk about it per capita because it, it, it's all about your chances of being a victim of crime, whether you live in a small city or in, in, in New York City. So this chart really talks about the population growth in Albuquerque over time. Those four bars are the four lowest crime rates on history, and the red line is the crime rate trending in general. Now look at the very end. It's going up, and that's why we're here today. So if we talk about murders, going back to, to, to 1996 or 1997, we had the most murders uh, in our history. It was 1996, we had 70 murders. So for the murder rate in 2016 to be as high as it was in, in, two, in 1996, so 1996 had 70 murders. If we had 70 murders today, are we safer or less safe than we were in 96? Statistically, we'd have to have 108 murders to have the same murder rate we had back in 1996. But we also always have to, especially us as elected officials, we always have to pull it back to, and understand, if you've been a victim of crime, raise your hand if you've been a victim of crime in the last year. Look at that. You know what your crime rate is? 100%. Your crime rate's 100%. So, but it's helpful to remember that also this rise that we're seeing is a fairly recent phenomenon, and it's vital to remember that for two reasons. Number one, because it reminds us, again, that we know how to drive crime down, and number two, it should ask us, what has changed? A lot's the same, but a lot of things have changed, as I said. So there's a look at our past crime history. Now, let me tell you how our 2015 numbers in Albuquerque stacked up nationally and locally. This chart shows the differences in crime, and I know um, if you don't have your, re your distance glasses on, all of this, some of this is on your table, and we're going to put this all on our website. It shows the different categories of crime that have increased in the last year and compared to average years in Albuquerque, and it also shows categories that have increased or decreased. So last year in the city of Albuquerque, all but one category increased. We had 46 murders. That, frankly, is one more than average. Aggravated assaults and robberies also increased, also being above historical averages. And aggravated assaults are still well below average. With respect to our property, burglar, property crime, burglaries were down, actually, last year. And our burglary rate is still well below historical averages. And then we have auto theft, which saw significant increases in the last 16 to 18 months to two years. We were 5,000 auto thefts last year. Current year data indicates that we're going to have another tough year for auto theft in Albuquerque. Uh, the next slide, we, we try to compare Bernalillo County. Same story in Bernalillo County, and quite frankly, the same story in the state of New Mexico as a whole. Crime is pretty much up across the board. But it's not just a New Mexico phenomenon. As I told you earlier, I talked to lots of mayors. I'm in the leadership, uh, whatever you call it, leadership ranks of the US Conference of Mayors, and we talk about this a lot. Some of the up upticks that we see are really worrisome national trends. Violent crime is spiking in some big cities for the first time in decades. Crime in Denver, for example, 
just pulling off Google news, newspaper headlines, is up in seven of nine categories, and it's up in every single neighborhood in Denver. Um, Austin's murder rate this year is up 80%. These aren't, you know, Albuquerque, Austin, Denver, these, these are great cities. So we shouldn't put ourselves in just a pigeonhole. But unfortunately, what we're finding as we talk around the country is there's not a ton of consensus right now on what's going on. Uh, we had some really spikes in crime in the 80s and 90s, and there's not a lot of people coming together on exactly why nationally crime is going up all of a sudden. There's theories, and we'll talk about some of those today. So let's talk about how we stack up nationally. We took the FBI crime data, and there's a bunch of it, and we looked at American towns and cities that report crime. And you can see that Albuquerque is ranked 321st in America for crime. That means your chances of being a victim here are, three, you know, there's 320 places where your actual chances of being a victim of crime are higher. Um, we're 375th nationally for violent crime. Now there's thousands of cities, so we're in an upper tier, okay? But the fact is, we're, we're 375th. And it's, once again, it's per capita. When we looked at big cities, over 100,000 in America, Albuquerque, your city, is about the 32nd largest city in America, and we're the 34th for violent crime. And our murder rate is 94th. So that means that there's 93 cities in America last year, over 100,000 in population, where you had a better chance of being murdered in Albuquerque. Um, and of course, you see, if we start looking at our property crime rates, we are much higher. We are 11th nationally in property crime rates. And much of that is being driven by this uptick in auto theft. This is an interesting map I want you to look at because, because it, it shows violent crime rates in America. Every blue state is below average. Every red state is above average. From California to Florida, so, southern, in the southern US, except for Mississippi, Mississippi, did they beat us again? Um, that's a joke. But, but every, every, um, every red state is higher. Now you can see New Mexico is, is third highest for violent crime, but we put the top 10 of violent crime states. And I don't know why that is, but I think it, it's an interesting stat. Now let's take a look at what happened in New Mexico. Uh, New Mexico is third highest for violent crime. And if we look at where Albuquerque stands in our state for violent crime, we are 11th. There are 10 cities in New Mexico that have a higher violent crime rate than we have. But if I can get you to flip the chart, uh, there we are, number one. Number one for auto theft. And that's not where we want to be. Just some context. Just some context for you to kind of think about where things stand today and what's going on. But part of the analysis I wanted Peter to do was really get down to your neighborhoods. I wanted to take a micro look at the city. And so we did that. We did it by zip code. And I'm going to show you some maps here, and then I'm going to invite you to a website so you can look up where you live. This map uh, includes also data from the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office, I believe, uh, as, as well. So you can see the property crime rates tend to be greatest in the mid heights. That's probably because that's where the retail centers are and that's most property crime, quite frankly, is shoplifting. As well as the south central and southeast parts of Albuquerque. Next slide is violent crime. Violent crime was highest in south central and southeast Albuquerque uh, is, as, and it was far less violent crime on the west side and, uh, and far less in the northeast part of Albuquerque. We also wanted to compare it and kind of let you know how your neighborhood stacks up. We talk about per capita with our national numbers. We did that here locally as well. We compared your crime rates uh, by zip code. So you can see if you live in 87110, uh, that's the center city again, uh, you tend to be the toughest area for property crime. You are 6% of our city population, but you're 13% of our property crime. If you live in 87108, the fairgrounds and international district, you are also 6% of our city population and you have 15% of our city's violent crimes. And here's the zip code, um, 87114, uh, that is North Valley, Montana Ranch and Paradise Hills. You have the lowest rate of property crime in the city. And zip code 87112, which is North Albuquerque Acres and Sandia Heights, you have the lowest violent crime rate. We did this for a reason. Um, we want you to know about what's going on in your neighborhood. This next map, map is an interesting one. This is a dot heat map of uh, residential and commercial locations that have the greatest number of police calls for service that encompass all types of crime. Of the 14 top locations, 
10 of them are retail establishments. Remember, most crime is larceny, shoplifting. And uh, 10 of them, oh, and six of them are Walmarts. It's simply a good reminder, as I said, it's nothing against Walmart, it's just that, you know, when a pair of socks is stolen, that hits your crime rate just like when there's a murder. I mean, it's not the same thing, we understand that, but, but crime rates are numbers. And so one of the best ways you can drive your crime rate down in any city is to tackle property crime. I'm gonna invite you to go to cabq.gov and uh, hit cabq.gov forward slash crime profiles and you can, uh, you can look at your neighborhood. And the reason we want you to do that is because we want you to get together with your neighborhood associations. Chief Eden and his staff also are looking at this data so that we can put valuable resources where they need to be. All right, so let's look at, let's look at auto theft. It is by far the, the largest felony property crime category in any city, Albuquerque included. As you can see, this is a month over month auto, auto crime um, chart. And you can see the steep increases month over month during 2015, and we're seeing that increase continue into this year. We did maps by beat. These are, these are your officers. These are beats that are your APD officers have. And you can see that the largest number of auto thefts occur in the east side of the city. They kind of run all the way down the Rio Grande, all the way from uh, mid-city, all the way down south. So the primary uh, of goal of our study was to find out, okay, there's the data, some good, you know, some better than you probably thought, some worse than you probably thought, uh, at least when it comes to comparing ourselves to other places. But we wanted to study the theories, and there are probably 100 theories, we picked three, because of the three that I hear most as a mayor. Number one, what's driving this? Is it the economic conditions? We've been through the toughest recession in recent modern, hit, well, modern history, and maybe in history. Is it that? Um, has it been the reduction in the jail population? Or is it tied more to the number of our police officers because our police officers are down at APD as well? As you can see, with respect to the first theory, this map basically what it shows you is that um, the trend in unemployment has gone down. And look, nobody, nobody's spiking the ball, you know, the football on this one, but we've had 34 consecutive months of job growth in our, in our metro. Our unemployment rate has continued to fall. Exports and home sales are rising. Medium home prices are increasing. And medium income is improving. And some indicators, like our lodger's tax revenue, are up for the fourth year in a row. So once again, I'm giving you Peter's data here. Um, Peter has concluded that there's really not a connection between our local economy right now and in the, the rise in auto theft. It's not to say that all of these don't have some factor uh, into it. We also know that poverty always matters when it comes to crime. and We have a high pro property rate in New Mexico and higher than normal in Albuquerque as well. So we don't want to discount that. So the second theory we looked at was, has the reduction in the jail population over the past several years had an effect and our study shows that it has. It has had an effect. As you can see, when I took office, we're gonna show you some charts. Uh, hang with me. There's a lot of data on this, and we'll get you bigger ones if you need them. There were over 3,000 inmates in the county jail, but there was a problem at the county jail, and it was a real problem, and the folks at the county jail and the county had to solve it. They had a McClendon lawsuit that had been here for decades that required a reduction in the inmate population. So, what good elected officials do and what smart policymakers do is they, they get together and they think about it. And the state of New Mexico passed the Bernalillo County Criminal Justice Reform Commission. It included Supreme Court, you know, the Supreme Court Administrative Office of the Courts, representatives from the District Court, Metro Court, County Commission, County Sheriff, DA, our Chief, uh, and others. So in September of 14, that commission issued its preliminary findings and it spelled out some roadmaps forward to get that overcrowding at the jail. Um, and, and, in, and as I said, it was, a, it was a worthy goal. I mean, nobody, none of us want anybody languishing in jail waiting for a fair trial. But as it turns out, it has had some significant consequences. If you look at the chart, you'll see that in 2014, um, the jail population began to plummet down to 2,400 inmates, then to 1,700 inmates, and then to around 1,500 inmates this year. Well, I think we're still hovering around 1,500. Part of the reduction also coincides with a decision by the New Mexico Supreme Court. 
that restricted the ability of judges to hold some criminals without bail. I will not be the guy to tell you the specifics of that. Um, we'll have other folks do that, but it, it, it's there. And then shortly after came that case management order that I talked about, where um, our district attorney's office was required, I'm gonna read you the words, because I'll get it wrong if I don't, um, mandating that all discovery and evidence used for indictment must be provided at arraignment within 10 days if the custody is in suspect, or is in, if the suspect is in custody. So that's a very short time frame. Both the DA and my chief have, have uh, expressed concerns. So the McClendon lawsuit, policy decisions, people moving out of jail, Supreme Court decisions, um, there's less people in jail, so what's the results? We have a jail population that is half the size it was a couple of years ago, and it's below the design capacity of the jail. Um, Peter's research look, talks about the jail being about 75% full today with a capacity still under the, uh, the cap of about 400 inmates. Um, and the big thing about this is it wasn't a very sudden thing. You can kind of look over the years. It, it was up, it was down, then it was up again a little bit in 12, and then down a little bit, and it's seen a pretty dramatic drop. It wasn't eased in over time. So this brings us to one of Peter's key findings of our research, and that is, uh, I'm gonna quote Dr. Peter Winograd, quote, without question, there is a direct, strong correlation between the significant reduction of the jail population and the steep rise in auto thefts. And this chart will show you. Uh, Corey's gonna run the chart. Red line is uh, auto thefts, blue line is jail population. Uh, we get to 2014, the jail population started to be reduced in earnest, and uh, auto thefts jumped up a little bit. In 2015, 30% of the inmates were released from the jail, and you can take a look at what happened to auto thefts. So, um, so there's a, a correlation. I'm not a statistician, but Peter, I think, calls that causal, uh, not, not coincidental, Peter, uh, either way. But it's, the point is there's a direct correlation there. Okay, well that's, that's a couple of lines on a graph. So I asked Peter, can we go in and can we actually find out? Okay, there's a, something, let's dig deeper. And we went in and we uh, wanted to be able to identify individuals by name if we could who committed auto thefts in our city. And our data sharing isn't where it needs to be today uh, between the city and the jail system. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but Peter still found a bunch. Uh, in 2015, there were 945 separate individuals who were arrested by APD for committing a felony property crime. Remember, felony property crime, mostly auto theft. After digging through the data, Dr. Winograd found uh, 114 offenders who had multiple arrests in 2015 and who were released from jail multiple times. 114, multiple arrests, released multiple times. Let me run through some examples for you. This, uh, this individual, his name is Christopher Dominguez. He was arrested seven times in 2015. Six of them for auto theft. He was arrested in March, May, June, July, August, September, and again in November. This next fellow's name is Eric Ariano. He was arrested eight times in 2015. Five times for property crime offenses, three of which were auto thefts. Two of his arrests happened in the same month. Next we have Mr. David Romero, arrested six times last year, five of which involved burglarizing or stealing a car. And then there's James Dots, arrested three times for property crime in 2015, and he's already been arrested four times this year. So we got some folks getting in and out of jail uh, for various reasons, uh, maybe deemed nonviolent, maybe too poor to post bail, Maybe a difficult time assembling the case quickly enough, but whatever reason they were sent back into our neighborhoods, a lot of times with the same underlying problems they went into jail with in the first, the first time, and they were arrested month after month by your police officers. So no wonder we keep hearing about this revolving door because it looks like it's there. And the best way I can put it is, you know, our folks are doing a pretty good job on the catch side, um, but we have some issues that we need to address on the release side. Uh, of this equation, and quite simply, I guess I'll just say as a mayor, sometimes we just gotta keep the bad guys in jail. And, and I think that's kind of a no-brainer, I don't mean to be wagging fingers at that, but, but it just seems to be common sense. And it's not just the people that I mentioned earlier, like I said, there's 114, we're gonna put some pictures up here for you, uh, released from jail. Um, there's gonna be, as we fly through here, these, these were the 114 people that we found. Um, I'll just let that run while I'm talking. So we want to make it clear that we understand that overcrowding at the jail is not good and no one should have to languish in jail for 14 months waiting for a fair trial. 
but I think we could all agree that nobody should get out in 14 minutes um, when they've done something serious in our neighborhoods. And I'm not suggesting in any way, shape, or form that we put 1,500 people back in jail. I think, I think there's been a lot of good done with that relief system. And there's a lot of people that are getting the help that they need because of that. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. But if we can concentrate on a small number of individuals, uh, keep these folks from doing harm in our community while still protecting their constitutional rights, I think that's a good thing. So another key finding, are we done with that thing? There's a bunch of them. So another key finding of the research showed that the impact that relatively small number of repeat car thieves actually can do. Uh, common sense tells you that thieves actually never get caught stealing their first car. Just like a drunk driver is usually not caught in the first time they've been drinking and driving. I'm told that a proficient car thief can steal five to seven cars a week and that uh, many of them can steal cars within a, you know, several cars in one day. So Dr. Winograd, our researcher, came to the same conclusion. His finding is that roughly, quote, 46% of Albuquerque's 5,179 auto thefts in 2015 were committed by a relatively small number of repeat offenders. So that's your spike. That's half. If that data, you know, we can have some disagreement on that, but that's what the data shows. So let's hy say hypothetically that these folks were in jail or they weren't out stealing cars. Uh, the number of auto thefts could have been potentially far lower, back to normal, somewhere around 2,800. God, we wish that number was zero, don't we? But in other words, detaining a small number of offenders would make a huge difference. Other national research shows that most property crime offenders are stealing to support an addiction. Uh, and it's worth revisiting uh, early release criteria for offenders uh, at the same time that we are addressing the underlying issues. I wanna, I wanna commend our county commissioners. They just put a, several million dollars last week, commissioner, into uh, that when he did the, the tax increase to, to do mental health and, and uh, um, and drug abuse, that's, that's money is starting to get put to use, and so thank you for doing that. Um, that two, I think out of the five million, a couple million's going right to drug, uh, drug systems. And you add that to the 20 million plus that we spend in the city budget every year for substance abuse and mental health things, that makes a difference. Uh, and it's a move in the right direction, so thank you. Thank you for doing that. So the third theory, so let's turn the can into me as your mayor, and let's talk about our police department. Let's talk about the numbers at our, at our PD. Um, we need more officers. So as I start talking about all of this stuff, let me say we need more police officers. Our officers are stressed and we need to get up to 1,000. 1,000 is the number that Dr. Weiss put together, another research study that we did that was required by the DOJ settlement agreement and so we know that we need that. But I think it's a, it's a mistake and our data is gonna prove that the rhetoric, going back to the rhetoric, it's a mistake just to say less cops, more crime and our data is going to prove that to you today. Our research says that there is not a strong correlation between the size of our force per capita also um, and, and crime rates. Although, if you look at the tail end of the chart, we have been losing officers while crime's been going up, but we've also had times where crime's been going up and officers have been going up. We've also had time where crime's been going down while officers have been going down. So we're sitting right around 850 today at APD, down from um, about 1,070, um, in 2010. That's about a 20% reduction. That is not as bad as some cities, it's worse than others. However, I, I wanna commend my chief for doing a great job. He has one of the most robust recruiting efforts going on right now that this department has ever had. He has taken more officers behind, from behind the desk and put them out into your neighborhoods than ever before. When I took office, about 46% of PD was out taking calls. Right now, it's about 57% of your police are out taking calls. So what that means is even though the force has dropped 20%, you've only lost about five and a half to 6% of your field force. And we're gonna talk about some solutions for that today. And he's also done a good job that what that, what that means is that there's about 13% more cops in the field than there were when he took over a couple of years ago. All right, so here's the same graph earlier that we talked about jail population when we talked about um, the number of auto thefts. And I had Dr. Winograd kind of overlay your police officer numbers in this um, particular slide, just to kind of give a graphic representation. It's hard to see because you're a long ways away, but you can see the officer numbers in the field climbing from 2013 um, forward. So as I said earlier, we need to get back to 1,000 officers. There's no question uh, about it. And I think, Chief, you've got 31 cadets. 
um, that will be graduating in December. But it would be inaccurate just to fall back on this idea that uh, the big surge in auto theft, at least from what we found, was based on officers. Uh, I think it's somewhere else in here today, but you know our, our solve rate is still above most cities our size. So other data backs this conclusion up as well. Uh, several of our historically, uh, historically low crime rate years came when the size of the, of the police force was falling. A testament to your officers who are out there just busting their behinds for you. And several of our historically low crime years came at a time when the size of the police department also was falling. Here's another way to, uh, to look at it. That green line uh, represents the number of police officers per capita. And you can see that at different points um, throughout uh, the uh, the, the last number of years, we've had more police officers. Actually, we had more police officers per capita during our high crime years than we had during our, our low crime years. So that's an interesting decoupling of that. And from a performance standpoint, um, we wanted to look at, and I think there's been some media coverage of this, about arrests being down. So arrests were down about 10% last year, so we wanted to look at that. And uh, for violent and property crimes, and arrests actually by your police officers for violent property crimes have remained relatively stable and consistent over the past six years, even as the size of the force has shrunk. Um, our rate for solving auto thefts and murders is still higher than similar sized cities in many cases around America. And it has to be acknowledged that 911 calls are increasing. Uh, they're up to 400,000 calls last year. But here's what has happened, and you know it if you've been a victim, if you're one of those people that raised your hand. Our emergency call response times are still very good. They're still within the bandwidth. But if you're a non-emergency call, your response times have increased. Once again, I'll talk about that with our plan later. Um, fewer officers has also had an impact in a couple of other key areas, mostly with traffic, mostly with our traffic unit. It is way down from where it needs to be and where it used to be. And that's a consequence of lower officer numbers. And when you do that, um, part of that 10% dip in arrests was for misdemeanor warrants because a lot of times you pick people up with multiple speeding tickets when, during traffic stops and some of them were felony warrants um, actually. And that's why it's so good and we're so pleased that our federal partners, if there's any in the room, we want to thank you. You may have seen the news recently, um, our federal partners, the, the U.S. Marshals, the U.S. Attorney, ATF and others came into Albuquerque like they have in other cities. They did a, a worst of the worst and they were able to take a hundred of the worst of the worst drug and grunk, uh, gun criminals off of our streets. So even though our warrant, uh, warrant arrests were down a little bit, we had some great partnerships that were helping that. So we're going to try to get back to a thousand officers and I'll talk more about that later. So. I guess this just kind of brings us back to this idea, what are we gonna to do together? Um, city doesn't run the jail anymore. County doesn't run APD. Manny doesn't run the police department. Gordon doesn't run the sheriff's department. We don't run the court systems. Judge Nash doesn't run uh, 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 our side of the equation. There are a lot of players in this equation. And I'm gonna say it again, um, you should be proud of these folks. They're working hard for you, okay? But I want to talk about some strategies that we can, that we can do to, to make things better. Um, it all involves collaboration and it all involves every part of the criminal justice system. So we're going we're gonna to give you some ideas today. We're calling this ACT now because uh, I'm from government and I can't do anything without an acronym. So it is Attack Crime Together Now plan in the city of Albuquerque and it's got 13 basic points and there's some things you can do as well. First, uh, we need to improve data sharing. We've already talked to some of our commissioners. We think we can do that fairly easily and um, that's going to happen. We, uh, one of the things we found by studying the data is that we don't have enough data to study and we're going to get together and, and figure that one out. Um, secondly, we are going to work on increasing the officers at my department, the one that Gordon and I run for you. Uh, we're implementing an aggressive staffing plan that we rolled out a couple of uh, months ago to get more cops back into your neighborhoods. Uh, we've increased pay since I've been the mayor about 20% for our police officers to make sure we're still the highest paid department to start anywhere in New Mexico and I think most places except for one or two cities in the entire region. Um, we've implemented longevity pay to keep officers to try to combat that, that pension uh, drop off that we had. Uh, we were going to for the first time, and I didn't want to go this route, but we're going to allow lateral transfers into APD. And then with our recent um, union contract, the officers overwhelmingly voted for 12-hour shifts, which is part of what Gordon's plan is to get them back into your neighborhoods. We need those 12-hour shifts. And it turns out your police officers really like that. They really like uh, the opportunity to do that. Um, 
So we're recruiting officers like we never have before. Um, but as I talk to people around the state and around the country, and as you look at some news reports around the country, in fact, here's an ABC News story that reads, uh, with some applicants and departments down 90% in some cities, police departments may soon be posting signs that say help wanted instead of most wanted. <laughs> you know, interesting times in America, right? Houston's down, Dallas is down, Las Vegas is down, Portland's down, Phoenix is down 15%. Um, I, don't, I saw a story about our state police. I'm not sure where they are today, but I think they are down. But I just had 40 mayors in Albuquerque from all over New Mexico, and it's a problem for all of them. And it's hard to bring police officers in the front door these days, and it's more enticing because of some of the pension changes um, to leave earlier than you normally would have. So we uh, have to be able, and this is gonna be a pitch, this is one of my pitches today, we have to be able to re, uh, rehire uh, retired police officers to move back into our police force, just like we did for 23 years in New Mexico, and just like many states around us still currently do. Uh, return to work legislation is the most important, powerful policy change that we can adopt. And Bill Ream is here, he's a state representative, and he's been pushing for that, he's a, he's a former cop, and he's been pushing for that in the state legislature. Thanks for your leadership on that, Terry. Thank you in the chamber for pushing for that as well. So we've been asking for four or five years for return to work, and that's the thing I talked about earlier. It, it went away about two months after I took office, and we had it uh, in New Mexico for, for over 23 years. Um, last year, we finally got it through the House after we did another study. I know I'm sounding like a study guy, but we had legislators saying, I just can't vote for this because it's going to hurt the pension solvency. We hired an actuarial to come in, and we've proven that not only does it not hurt the pension solvency, it actually could help it in the long run. So we took that off the table, gave our legislators a good reason to vote for this. It passed the House. It had the support of 33 county sheriffs. That's all the county sheriffs. It had 35 mayors sign up. That's 80% of your state's population. Um, but then I think I'm afraid to say politics got in the way and it died again in the Senate. And so I'm going to be back. I'm going to be back and it's not going to help me much, but I want your next mayor to have return to work. And, and you're going to find um, a petition on your table today and if you feel so compelled to do it, please sign it. We'll just add it to the, to the other cries for a change to get your police officers back where they can retire. And it doesn't help just Albuquerque, it helps get chiefs in smaller communities, it helps get sheriffs in smaller communities. It's just something that we really need to do. So in the meantime, um, we are going to announce a workaround. This is a classic workaround of the situation and Rob Perry um, my CAO has been working on this for about a year. And here's what it looks like. It's called Community Response Specialist. And under this program, we are going to send legislation to the City Council that will allow us to contract with 22 of those retired police officers. And we're not going to bring them back on the force. But they will respond to non-emergency calls, things like home burglaries or break-ins and auto theft. They will not be armed on the job. Um, and they will only respond after the call has been cleared by APD. So they'll be able to do things like CSI investigations, dust for fingerprints, interview witnesses, take reports, do much of the important follow-up work, get information to judges if they need to, just be out there working in the community as best that they can to help alleviate some of the officer shortage that we have. And that legislation will go down fairly soon. Those 22 CSR or CRS specialists um, have the ability to relieve our sworn officers, we think, of about 33,000 hours, man hours of work per year in the community. That's working with you after your car got stolen. That's working with you after your house got broken into, after all the normal police work has been done and just helping to build cases and track cases and maybe even track some of these 114 individuals to make sure that we know where they are. If you, if you take an average police officer that might be able to do three proactive things during an hour of their time, things like community policing, things like um, doing proactive drive arounds in their neighborhoods, we think we can create 100,000 proactive police actions in our community if we can get this put into place. And it's a pilot program. It's an attempt to try to do something better than is happening today. And if we can get return to work um, done, um, maybe we won't need that in the future, but today I think we need to do something. We're also going to continue to adjust our policies and our tactics, um, using this data to put manpower where it's most needed. 
Uh, our data sharing is getting much better in, 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 within the police department and it's allowing us to react uh, to people that we know are actively stealing cars right now and is uh, in areas that are hot spots today and right now. Chief could probably tell you uh, pretty closely um, where the most cars will be stolen in Albuquerque um, in, the, in the coming days. But we also are asking the criminal justice system and the reform commission to see if there are some adjustments that can be made in the criteria for pretrial release. And I'm not gonna stand here today and tell you I have those answers. But I think it's time that maybe we sit down and take a look at that um, so that we don't have people that have the opportunity to spin through the revolving door. Again, we're not talking about 1,500 people back in jail, but 115, 120, 200 people or thieves. If we could find out a way to keep them from stealing, all of our lives are gonna be better. And maybe we can make their lives better at the same time. But in conjunction with the policy changes, we're asking judges, um, if they can, and within their judgment, uh, to use the laws that we do have in the state of New Mexico uh, to the highest and best use. They have to make those calls from the bench every day. Um, we're asking that, uh, that they come and do their job again, um, that they do well, but take a look and see what we're doing. And this cry is, is kind of coming nationally, and I think we're, we're in a danger point with this. Um, it's easy, to, going back to the politics, it's easy to wag fingers, and it's easy to wag finger to judge. Um, and here's a couple of quotes. Uh, Washington, D.C. Chief Kathy Lanier, uh, one of the America's most popular chiefs, she just retired. She took a job at the NFL as head of security. On her way out the door, she said, people want more police. They want more arrests, but if we're arresting the same people over and over again, there's got to be some questions being asked. Chicago had 90 homicides last month, 90. The most in two decades, their superintendent, of course, you know, people logically go to the chief because they know him by name. Um, they say, what's going on? And he said, repeat gun offenders who drive the violence on our streets should not be there in the first place and it's time to change the laws to ensure these violent offenders are held accountable for their crimes. So it's not a just here thing, but it is a here thing too. Next, we need to give judges the tools they need to hold the worst of the worst offenders um, in jail without bond, like they used to. And I'm advocating, and I know there's some folks in the room here today that aren't uh, advocating for it, but as a mayor, I am advocating for the, the uh, constitutional amendment in uh, November, uh, because I think it will make a difference. Now, maybe there's some tweaks that have to happen, and I know there's a lot of concern in the bail markets about that, but I'm convinced that it, it would be a positive thing today. And we need to make adjustments in the 10-day rule again. Not too long ago, the Supreme Court, I have to give them credit, they came down, they talked to our DA, Chief was there, uh, my, my CAO was there, about adjustments to the 10-day rule. I'm still hearing it's a problem, so we're asking folks to come back to the table and talk about that. And we also know that the courts, like everybody else, are strapped for resources. So another new thing that we're going to do today is we're gonna announce a repeat offender citizen advocate program. Pretty simple thing but we're gonna have a couple of people that we will hire to follow these cases through the system, um, not to sit in the back of a courtroom and give a starey, stare down to the judge to make sure that the hammer comes down, but just to be there as an extra resource to make sure that we have the information and the judge has the information that they need. I think it was good last year that the legislature passed this uh, information to share with our judges. The more information our judges have, I can't imagine how that could be a bad thing. So, those are some of the things that we're doing, and then we're gonna call on our legislature again. And Terry, you did a great job of this last year. Many in the business community did the same thing. And Bill knows this, I served with you, man. You know, and you're pushing it, you're doing it, they're doing it the way it needs to be done, but our legislature needs to ensure that New Mexico is no longer to be, uh, you know, that, that we're not the best state in the Southwest to hurt a child or kill a cop or lead a, a life of crime. I mean, it's just that simple. And I was a two-term legislator, and uh, it's easy to overswing on that, but we are, in my opinion, underswinging today uh, in New Mexico, and we've seen too many tragedies in our state because of it. Um, when we have, you know, when New Mexico you know, has a criminal, it needs to be act actively dealt with and swiftly and decisively, um, and we need to better protect our children and our families and our police officers and, and our property. And then, of course, uh, technology matters. And we are going to, if you don't have it, I'm gonna make a pitch for it today, different speech, but if you don't have a 311 app, download it, because we need your uh, eyes and ears out there. It's a great app we have at the city. Uh, we are going to launch the mobile PD app. 
and it's an every it's an app uh, when you see it on the news and the media will, I'm sure will cover it please download it it will allow you to report a crime submit crime tips look at who's most wanted in the city and in your neighborhoods and simply me be more engaged and proactive as citizens um, it's going to make interacting with your police department easier it's going to help us share information better and be more agile you're our eyes and ears you know, we rely on you every day to be out there looking for crime, and we need your help more than ever. So our solutions can't just be about putting people in jail. I get that. Uh, we need to continue implementing community-wide strategies to combat substance abuse and mental health. Um, there's some very interesting conversations going on right now between the county and the city. Uh, we're looking at maybe the city buying some property and the county managing a mental health crisis center. Lots of good conversations going on about that. There will be more to talk about because we're not there yet, but I'm looking forward to working with everybody on that. And then um, we just need to wrap our hands around this idea that um, there are pro proactive, I guess is the word, and common thing, sense things that we can all do. So uh, we're going to leave you with some of those with your collateral material today. Take them home. And I know they look simple, but dang, man, every time, what, Chief, we have what, a, a huge amount of our property crime in Albuquerque are crimes of opportunity. And so you can actually impact your future with this. Uh, don't leave valuables in your car, especially not your purse, your keys, your garage door opener. Um, I had a woman the other day came up to me and said, I got my car got broken into, I can't believe it, this and that. I went back and looked at it and I had to pull the police report. Left her purse on the front seat, had $1,500 in it. And, and, and God, God bless her, but, but that's, a, that's a magnet. Um, you need to put the end of the practice of warming up your car in the winter. Please don't warm up your car in the driveway. Good Lord, we have so many cars stolen doing that. Keep your garage door closed. My wife gets on me on this all the time when I'm out mowing the yard. Close the garage door. That's a crime of opportunity. Uh, if you can park your car in the garage, that's great. Uh, do that. Um, use online um, payment systems and PO boxes rather than having checks in your mailbox. Get a locking mailbox. You've heard the stories about people stealing in mailboxes. That's something you can do. Trim your landscaping. Don't give, cre you know, give uh, thieves a good place to hide. Best thing you can do may involve a casserole. You're looking at me like, okay, he's completely lost now. But get to know your neighbors. You know, get to know your neighbors. Um, know who lives next door to you, who lives in the apartment above you, the apartment below you. Get to know folks that live around you. Reach out to them. Remember the welcome wagon and the, and the, and the uh, you know, um, taking, a, taking a cash roll to your neighbor. Just, just get to know um, your neighbors and it's gonna help. Um, especially for older folks, don't let strangers in your house. So many crimes happen because somebody cons a, a senior citizen into, into their home and bad things happen. Buy a burglar alarm if you have one, and then of course be situationally aware. Um, so many crimes happen in Albuquerque and around the country because people find themselves in places and they just weren't paying attention. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go to a bad part of town or anything like that, but just be situationally aware. And finally, and this is my last one, and I'm gonna close out and Chief and I are gonna talk to you a little bit. Um, support your cops. Continue to support your police officers. We are, we are implementing some of the you know, most interesting and meaningful police reforms in the United States. People are looking at us about what we're doing with our settlement agreement, what we did before the settlement agreement, lapel cameras, everything else that we're doing. And we're asking our police to do a lot, and now they're shorthanded. And, and I'll tell you, I gave a speech recently in, uh, about community trust, and, and I'm convinced after seven years, you know, that relationship between the public and the police is built on a foundation of trust. And when that foundation is strong, and when you and your police department team up to fight crime, you can make your community safer. And unfortunately, what's happening, I think, in America right now in many cities, thank goodness not here, is that the community and the police um, aren't on the same page, and um, it's making a significant difference. So look, this is a beautiful city. We're full of wonderful people. I know hundreds of mayors around the country. I wouldn't trade with a single one. I wouldn't. And this is our home, and we want it to be a safe place for our families. And we're in this together. We did it before. We drove crime rates down, and we need to drive them down together again. And even though we have some concerns about the way the justice system works and about our officer numbers and about the populations in the jail, we can make a difference if we act now and if we come together. So 
I, you know, I know that's a lot of data in a short time, but I want to say thanks for letting me come and talk to you about this difficult issue. I want to thank you for letting me be your mayor. I'll be the mayor for another year and a half. The goal is simple. Let's hand it off better than we found it. And let's make sure that we set the next mayor up, whoever he or she is, whether they're a D or an R, doesn't matter. Let's set them up for success. Let's do some of the heavy lifting now so that uh, we can springboard off of this administration and uh, just uh, keep looking forward to a brighter future. So thank you. I killed most of you.